Welcome, I'm uh, Al Fox and uh, I'm chairing uh, today's OI conference, Data Interpretation AI Track. And the session is Machine Learning, Survey, Navigation and Surveillance, oh sorry, Simulation Session. That's a bit of a mouthful. So today, my first speaker, I've got three talks, is Adrian Boyle. He's the CEO of uh, the Catholic Group. Many people know Adrian and have used his products and services. Um, he has a PhD in physics and He's always been interested in laser and optical systems. He has worked uh, uh, in Sweden and most of us know him from his time in Ireland. Um, he joined Machine Vision Technology in 1998 and since 2009, he founded Catholic Ocean. Um, they're specialists in optical machine learning and automation. And many people know Adrian through um, the Catholic's camera system. Um, which has somewhat revolutionized how we do subsea and underwater inspection. So Adrian, over to you. Thank you, Al. So um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully that appears for everyone and we'll go into presentation mode. So I hope everybody can see that. Yep, makes sense. Okay, so what I'm going to talk today uh, about, about is robust real-time subsea machine vision uh, and with a focus on unmanned operations. Uh, so so uh, I'm also going to start my stopwatch because I've nobody to shout at me. Okay. Um, uh, in about 20 minutes time, I'm hoping if you're listening to this that you have a better sense of where what Catholics have done in the last four years. Uh, but more importantly, what we're working on uh, today, in part due to COVID, but also in response to climate change, uh, and what we're planning to release in 2021, uh, particularly for the purpose of deploying what we call fast digital inspection, uh, is, as I'll refer to, is, is what CATHEX imaging systems do. Uh, I'll explain that, uh, and I'll also explain what we're calling unmanned fast digital inspection, which is uh, the transfer of that technology into the unmanned scenario. So uh, very briefly, uh, Cathex, we're, we're based in Ireland. We started in 2009. Uh, our operations are globally, um, and, and essentially we, we work in Gulf of Mexico, Australia, uh, Aberdeen, and pretty much anywhere that there is AUVs or ROVs, we, we have systems uh, deployed. Uh, manufacturing and development is done in Ireland. Uh, and then our markets and the areas we work in are they range from oil and gas, uh, defense, oceanographic. Uh, and if you go to our website, you'll see many of the different case studies uh, where we cover things like sustainable fisheries, um, oceanographic research, uh, and, and particularly with, a, with, with an impact assessment uh, on uh, the ocean environment. So, so there's projects from the Alfred Wegener Institute. Uh, you can read a little bit about them. I'm gonna focus today on pipelines uh, and a little bit about structures at the end just to give a sense of what it is that Catholic systems do uh, in the unmanned environment. So, and if you want to do some reading, uh, we filed a bunch of patents in 2012 around all of the technologies that we described there in the public domain. Um, and and yeah, they, you can read them, but they, they're probably about 70 pages long, there's six of them. Uh, but they describe in quite a bit of detail what underlies what I'm talking about today. Uh, and you can read a little bit more about that. So, as I said, our focus since 2012, if you read those patterns, you'll also realize the language we used then uh, isn't the same language that's used today. There's different names for things. We've evolved the technology, we've evolved the language, uh, but, but we, it's in pretty basic terms in terms of augmentation, composite images, 3D models, um, and point cloud data sets. So, to give an overview of our customers, they cover the broad spectrum of uh, subsea contractors, oil and gas companies, um, a lot of AUV manufacturers. So, so, so we would have shipped maybe 30 to 40 systems to uh, Kongsberg Maritime for AUV for both defense and oceanographic uh, and for other applications. MMT was the first customer back in 2015. Uh, with MMT, we did the first um, fast digital inspection survey in, in, the, in the North Sea. Uh, and since then, we, we, we've shipped to almost all contractors. Uh, so focusing a little bit on, on, on the fast and, and, and fast digital inspection, if we look at a conventional uh, vessel, um, F is, is for fast. What we have proven across many um, pipeline and structural and other inspections at this point is 
that we can reduce the war plane by 70%. And this is achieved by essentially taking very large area, high resolution images. I'll show you what they look like in a few seconds, uh, but also collecting laser data. So in the, in, in, in the fast digital inspections performed to date, uh, you can record images only and build 3D models from photogrammetry. Uh, but when we set out at the beginning, that wasn't the intention. And, and there's reasons, and there's good reasons why. Uh, I won't go into them in a whole lot of detail, other than to say feature matching and photogrammetry when you're traveling at four knots um, is kind of slow uh, and it gets in the way. So, so hopefully by the time I've explained what we mean by unmanned FDI, I'll give you a better sense of uh, how we do things and why in that context. But, but fast digital inspection on its own typically reduces the boat time by 70%, uh, you know, between 50% and 70% is typical. Uh, for pipelines, it's probably closer to 70%. Uh, that means there's less people on the boat, less people offshore for, for that amount of time. Uh, and obviously there's le much less cost. So what that actually does though, from a point of view of the data is, You've now got less time on the boat to process the data. And I'll address that as we go through this presentation. Uh, these are some of the vehicles on which uh, our systems are integrated. So they range from autonomous vehicles on the left uh, to saber tooth type vehicles, down uh, to ENI and MODIS uh, in the second column. Uh, work class ROVs, we have a lot of systems on work class ROVs, uh, fast ROVs, as in the top, uh, number three at the top is the MMT, but also Deep Ocean uh, and a few others. And then on the far right, we have towed vehicles, and these are typically used in fisheries for, for shrimp counting and, and sustainable fisheries, essentially to count uh, shrimp and queen scallop nests in the seabed. So we've done quite a bit of work with the uh, fisheries board in Ireland and Northern Ireland uh, on those areas. Um, but all in all, you know, the whole idea is that we reduce the boat and we reduce the diesel consumption and the cost. Um, uh, one small technical detail, when we record data, we timestamp it uh, very precisely. So, so, so when we take an image, we do so in one millisecond. Uh, we timestamp it at the time of the acquisition. Uh, and we also then, if you, if you do the maths on that, if we're operating at three images or 30 images per second, that means there's 30 milliseconds during which the lights are on. But for the other time, we turn on a laser and we acquire three-dimensional laser laser. Uh, and that time stamping and synch synchronization is critical to the unmanned operation. And I'll explain that as we go through the presentation. To show some of the images, uh, this is the shark you can see in my background. It was taken in 2018 from a, a modest um, saber tooth AUV. Uh, the shark was actually fishing um, and doing some, taking some fish from the free spans as the AUV. Uh, and the guys in the boat uh, said that basically there was a conveyor belt of sharks doing some fishing as the, as the fish come out from under the free spans. If you look closely, you can kind of zoom in. These are UHD images. Uh, you can see very high resolution uh, pictures, uh, including down to the level of the shark's teeth. And remember, this guy is probably moving at about 10 knots uh, to come in and get that. So the one millisecond uh, motion freezes that movement. And that's one of the key things that gives us the, the, the high resolution even when we move fast. Uh, along with the images, we're acquiring laser data uh, and, and in the monochrome, the pure laser data, they're spatially and temporally co-registered. So we timestamp the images, we timestamp the laser, uh, and then we can spatially correlate them in tools like IVA, and that's largely what is used today. So, so, so the laser operates at one frame rate, the images at another, uh, and we can superimpose one on the other using the manual workflows. But our, our developments have, have moved away from that. Uh, so because we timestamp the uh, color images and the laser data, what we can actually do is color the pixels of the laser data with the image data. So we have direct correspondence between every pixel in the laser 3D point cloud and the image data. And that opens up a whole wealth of possibilities in terms of what we can do with those data sets in, in terms of processing them. Uh, and where that comes in is for, for, for unmanned FDI, what fundamentally it does is it changes the workflow entirely. Uh, I've used the local day, uh, James Ives will thank me for it, I'm sure, uh, X-Oceans AUV, they're not very far from where we are here in, in Ireland. Um, but essentially, in an unmanned world, we need to process locally, we need to process in real time, perform QC in real time, communicate to shore, uh, and what that actually brings up is the whole idea that we should be eventing automatically. 
uh, and, and doing the eventing while we're acquiring the data rather than at the other end. Uh, so, so if you look at the conventional workflows today, the data is collected, it's brought onshore, it's processed, the eventing is done and the deliverables are generated. And we're saying, well, for unmanned operation, we need to rethink that completely. Um, and I suppose the benefit of unmanned is if we have 70% less boat time in a normal operation uh, and we have 70% less diesel consumption, then that goes to better than 99%. And, and of course, less time with an unmanned vessel uh, is also got to be cheaper and less risky than, than, than a normal visual inspection. Uh, so, so there are different risks, but those risks, I hope, are addressed by what we're developing uh, in that context. So before I go into the workflow, this is a system that we are currently testing. It's planned for release in January. Uh, this is essentially very similar to our exist existing systems, but what we've done is we've put all of the subcomponents into one housing. So all of the cablings, the laser, the dual sensor, uh, all go into a single housing and they're all synchronized all in one box. And what that, this is to Al's point at, at the beginning of the conversation, uh, we had to respond to the market. We had guys offshore in Australia ready to go out on the St. Patrick's morning uh, and the insurers stopped the job because if somebody had an accident, they couldn't be sure that the hospitals could take them due to COVID. Uh, and what we realized that morning was, look, we need to accelerate this development uh, and be able to send systems offshore without CAPEX personnel with them. Uh, they need to be deployed easily, integrated and operated uh, remotely without personnel on, on the boat. So for CAPEX, uh, we're, we're putting this out early next year with the objective of using it on current operations for structural inspection, uh, but also for uh, pipeline inspection and, and many other applications. Uh, so there's a number of configurations to it. The specifications you can see, it's, it's about 27 kilos in weight. Uh, to give an idea of the size of it on a Sea Leopard or V, it fits on the front of it um, for forward-looking inspections. And then we have a downward-facing version that sits comfortably underneath it. Uh, there's two cables that connect onto it. it it's, it's plug and play. And I, to be honest, probably in the first quarter, we have a little bit of hand-holding. But I think after that, we should be ready to deploy it without much more than that with, with just remote support. Uh, on a work class ROV like the Shilling, we have what's the equivalent of our Pathfinder where we have a port and starboard unit uh, and we can also mount a forward system. And that these can all be daisy changed so that they're all triggered and synchronized. So essentially multiple cameras, lasers, all timestamped and synchronized together so that we have uh, an ROV. And typically these work class ROVs can go up to two knots in, in a thousand meters of water. Uh, in the North Sea, uh, and then on the faster vehicles, um, they can go up to four knots or on the UVs. Uh, but what's important, really, and what I want to kind of get across in this presentation is the, uh, the data and the timing. So if we take the left uh, in a conventional survey, typically that's 30 to 60 days of, of, of boat time. And I'm using an example of about 500 kilometers of pipeline in this case. Uh, and in some cases, it may be shorter, but let's, if, we, if we take 60 days as the, as the boat time, for the 500 kilometer pipeline survey. When we go to fast digital inspection, typically that reduces considerably. So, so sorry, uh, this is the 30 day. So, so, so we're typically talking about a 300 kilometer pipeline. Uh, so in the 30 day job that we, and we have a few examples of this, uh, we can typically reduce the time for that job by to a quarter, which is about seven days. Uh, but we haven't reported from a number of sources that the deliverables take considerably longer than that. And, and that's by and large because the methods for processing that data uh, are the methods that were used before and adaptations of them. And we've done quite a bit of work to make sure we comply as much as we can with those workflows. But as we go to unmanned FDI, uh, what we're aiming for is essentially in the short term at least uh, to for every day of, of data acquisition, but it's no more than a day of processing. And, and it can be much less than that, but, but we're at the time, we're at a place where we're trying to reduce that. In principle, if we go to the far right here, uh, if we and when we develop and deliver these systems in the field next year, uh, we expect that we will be able to do the event in, in real time. Uh, but there is complications. In other words, we're still waiting for the right unmanned vessel, we're waiting for the ROV, and all of those parts have to be right also. So, so this isn't just a case of CAPEX development. We need to work with the providers of those services in order to get this whole system working. Uh, but in principle, standing on its own today, on a, if we were doing this for, for a current vessel operation uh, and developing for that alone, it is quite feasible that we can perform automated eventing and deliverable generation during the acquisition time on the ROV. 
uh, and to, or, or even on the AV for that matter. So to try and explain that in a bit more detail, there's four elements to it. Uh, the first element is real-time processing. So we want to process data real-time as, as it is acquired. Uh, the second element of it is inline processing. And the difference between inline processing and real-time, when I talk about real-time, I mean, keep in mind that FDI is four times faster than a conventional survey. So, so we're already working in a compressed time frame. Um, so, so for an hour of conventional survey, you've got 15 minutes, which means that the data rate is four times faster. So real-time processing, uh, the applications of this are pilot assistance, pipeline tracking. We compress the images uh, so that we can transmit them to shore. And then we do heartbeat monitoring. Essentially, we monitor the progress of the survey. For the inline element of that, the automated eventing part, it's inline because it's not on the frame rate of one over 60, right? So our laser can operate, let's say, 30 lines per second or 60 lines per second. Real time refers to one thirtieth of a second. When I talk about inline, I'm talking about we might take multiple lines of laser, look at the stats on those, uh, and then accumulate that data to say, so, so it's not, it, it's probably within a second of acquisition. So the inline eventing is one of the major developments we can undertake. Uh, and with that, then we can tag those events. Uh, what that then lets us do is, once we've got our real-time processing for situation awareness, our inline processing, we can then look at the priority processing of that data and generate deliverables while the USB is offshore. So on a nine inch rack on the vessel, the whole idea and the way our deliverables are structured, as I said at the beginning, we're not doing feature matching. So, so how we actually generate the color point cloud is by aligning the pixels in temporal and geographical space, coloring them, and then using the images and that color point cloud to effectively generate meshes and ortho mosaics. It doesn't require photogrammetry. In the past, we have found some issues with repeatability, reliability, and particularly the time it takes to process photogrammetry data, the, the, the processing overhead. Uh, by avoiding using that, we can actually generate these deliver deliverables very, very quickly. And that leaves us with the very last piece, which is the deliverables and reporting. So as soon as the USB arrives to port, the objective is that all of that data gets uploaded in a, an Azure box uh, to the cloud in a way that now you can start to do inspection. And at the very end of the presentation, I'll give you a bit of a snapshot of what that looks like for uh, structural inspection. So if we just very briefly, I won't go into a whole lot of technical detail, uh, but to explain the word machine vision, which I used in, in the, in the, in the uh, slide title in presentation title uh, for unmanned fast digital inspection machine vision if we look at a single laser line in cross section in camera space not even in real world space what it gives us is essentially a geographic map or sorry a mathematical map uh, dimensionally accurate of the pipeline or the structure that's flying over so in other words it's a height profile uh, and it's accurate to the millimeter level so what we've actually got in this case uh, is from our Pathfinder system where we can extract from this single line of laser data the lowest point on the seabed. We can extract the top of the pipe, the edges of the pipe, uh, and the seabed. And what that actually lets us do is uh, extract information around uh, about the pipe and the, the scene. We can extract it for single laser lines or multiple laser lines. Uh, so, so, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but in effect, it, what differentiates machine vision from machine learning is we're using a physical measurement acquired in real time to draw a conclusion on what is in the scene. We're not using algorithms and feature matching and uh, blob detection. We're actually taking live laser data, extracting the information in, in the time period of the next laser line, accumulating that data and using it to extract information on the scene. And that opens a huge number of possibilities in some of the things you can do. And I won't go into them all now, but over the next few months, uh, we'll relay more information on that. The other things that are important are, so, so if you take that, you can say, well, look, I want to track the top of the pipe. Uh, we can also do image compression. Uh, we do image compression in our imaging systems already. Uh, but what that actually means is that if we take a HD image or, or, or undecimate it, we can relay images and the top of the pipe data in real time. Uh, to a pilot onshore and consume less than 20 kilobytes per second of, of bandwidth in doing that. Uh, and that lets us do things like real-time QC, real-time piloting, uh, and it's fundamentally taking less bandwidth and is more reliable than using video, for example. So uh, the next iteration of that, if you think about the automation, is to actually close the loop. And we have 
uh, with, with, with a customer in Italy, uh, shipped what we call a pipe tracker, which is a real-time feed into the underwater vehicle so that it can maintain its trajectory on the pipeline. So where that also matters is in the longer term, if there's a loss of communication between the underwater vehicle and the pipe and the, and the and shore, there is the capacity to build automation into the vehicle with this data set. Um, this is what it looks like. This was an early uh, development. It was done about two years ago, but it gives a picture of it. So on the right-hand side, we have the pipe, the laser data in camera coordinates. Uh, on the left, we have the corresponding image as we fly it. Uh, the data on the left is essentially giving a feed that we're locked onto the pipe. So the, the crosshair in the center of the screen is the ROV position. So what we're able to see is as the ROV travels the pipeline, we're able to in camera coordinates in, in, in real time, uh, see and visualize both the images and the features. And where this gets kind of interesting is if you look at the finer detail of what's happening in these lines, you can see the little dots and the blocks, you can see the red on the left. So where there is a feature or a physical structure uh, in this, in, in the scene, the laser picks it up and we can detect that also. But in this case, we're trying to track the top of the pipe. So we're, we're extracting the apex of the pipe data, the sides of the pipe. And you can kind of see where it stops there, where there's a tear in the field joint wrapper uh, that there is a rise. So this, this gives us real time dimensional data. Uh, and that's one of the aspects. This happens in the FPGA, in the sensor. So, so we can feed that out uh, as we collect it. If we take that a step further, um, we can do similar with free spans. So, so we have no requirement for now of processing, remember, we're literally looking at the structure of the measurement data as it feeds from the camera. So this lets us do segmentation of the pipeline and the seabed. Uh, it allows us to take endpoint measurements across the pipe. Uh, and remember, we've also got the corresponding images. So anywhere we have a detection of a signal on the free span, we can acquire those images and separate them. So think about this in an unmanned environment where as soon as we detect these changes, we can actually start to sort and separate that data by tagging it uh, and put that in for priority processing in the next stage. Uh, likewise, for, for, for rocks and objects, dropped objects, field joints, anodes, uh, there's a corresponding signature in the laser data that facilitates that. Um, just conscious of time, I'm going to skip through some of this. Uh, so essentially, priority processing refers to if we've gone out and we've collected these events, we then have the capacity to generate deliverables uh, on those events, either in color point cloud, in mesh, or the mosaics. Uh, we've been doing this um, for a couple of years with existing data sets. Uh, and it comes down to really what are the requirements of the integrity engineers. Uh, and by and large, it seems that the color point clouds are, 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 are particularly useful, particularly for free spans. Uh, but also the images then give verification and validation of, of, of what's seen in that data set. Um, uh, this is a much more fancy picture of one I've showed earlier, so I've covered most of the points in it. Uh, where we're trying to get to is automation and the whole idea that um, from, a, from the point of view of using laser data to perform real-time eventing, where we want to go is fully autonomous, unmanned, uh, fast digital inspection. So all of the elements that I've talked about uh, are there in a way that with a relatively low risk development over the next 12 months, our ambition is to be able to event, and it may not quite look like this, but to be able to pull these events from the data set uh, as it is collected, to provide cloud access to that data through, through an inspection machine. Uh, and that inspection machine is, is really, it looks like this. So essentially it's what we call CX Observer. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to talk about structures because, because if you look at work we've done with our clients in, in, in West Africa or in Australia, the whole idea of it is much like pipeline, we, we do the work in one fifth of the time, right? So we, we can reduce the time it takes for a, a, an inline T or a manifold by, by considerably, typically up to 80%. Uh, we do that by essentially flying the structure from a distance of two to three meters, um, doing QC on the data as it's acquired, but particularly doing the inspection onshore, not offshore. So what we've built is what we call CX Observer. It's the manual inspection tool that allows the inspection engineers to review that data, tag that data, to, to mark particular events and features on the structure in 3D, to review the images in 2D, and then to store those data sets, uh, and particularly to integrate them into Cobus uh, and into Nexus. So by the end of this year in December, we're doing it at the moment, uh, we'll have a full Cobus integration. Uh, and the whole idea is that this process, much like the pipeline, 
if you start off and think about the manual inspection workflow, which we have worked on so far, the next obvious iteration is in two years time when, when our clients go out to do this inspection the next time, we actually have the data in the right format in, in a way that uh, people can interact with it instantaneously, interact with it instantaneously, uh, and start to build automation into it in that way. So, so there's two elements. There's the current way we do it. There's the longer term objective, which is to automate it through machine learning, machine vision. Uh, and for structures and pipelines and whatever it is we're looking at underwater, the whole idea is we have real time data, we have QC, uh, pilot awareness, uh, and the same principles apply. But the whole idea is at the end of it, we have this data in a format that is standardized uh, in the cloud so that inspection engineers and integrity engineers can start to use it for integrity management, uh, which is really what we're all about. But from the unmanned fast digital inspection point of view, this approach essentially gives us data that uh, improves and facilitates uh, unmanned operations, both for pipeline and for structures. Uh, and then year on year, this methodology allows us to do things like pull up the previous point cloud, the previous image, start to, uh, it gives us that interface to both manage the data uh, and <clears throat> pull out the particular anomalies and track changes, uh, and essentially forms the basis for our data analytics platform, which is effectively uh, automatically pulling up specific defects on specific structures, but also comparing them across all structures. Uh, this presentation isn't about machine learning, it's about unmanned FDI, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. So to conclude, uh, hopefully not too late, uh, our fast digital inspection data method is really, it was developed for automation, it wasn't developed for, for the manual workflows today. So our objective is to reduce that time, the, the time of processing and deliverables, or, or, or as our clients call it, the, the data product uh, to the same time as acquisition but in parallel to reduce the time of acquisition, even in unmanned operations uh, to one quarter. Uh, and to do that effectively, the workflow changes, the deliverables change, uh, but we're working with our clients to define, okay, what are the deliverables required for? What is, what's important to integrity management? And then what's important in terms of reducing costs? So from a CAPEX point of view, uh, we're doing this already for existing operations. Uh, we're accelerating it due to COVID, and over the next four months, five months in particular, we expect to be performing unmanned operations uh, using this capability. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, we're going to have a, a half hour uh, round table at the end, so I, I've, uh, I have some questions, I'm sure the other uh, presenters will too, so appreciate your, uh, your presentation. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to the second talk, uh, which is um, by Hannah Thomas. So I'll give you a second, Hannah, to uh, to get your take over the, the screen sharing. So Hannah is um, the lead data science uh, person at L3 Harris ASV. Uh, so many of us in the industry know um, the work of ASV through their their vessels. Um, I know they've been doing a lot of work in on the sort of software and data side. Um, so she is an expert in um, data science, big data and associated technologies and machine learning. Um, she's worked across a number of industries, including investment banking and autonomy. Hannah has a master's degree in mathematics and computer science in the University of Oxford. Uh, and she enjoys explaining and teaching machine learning and data science techniques to industry. So take it away, Hannah, thank you. Well, you might need to take yourself off mute actually. That would be a good start, hey? Awesome. That's all right. We're all getting used to this. <laughs> Here we are. All right. So hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah, it's come through. Excellent. So I'm very happy to be here today uh, talking to you about uh, the machine vision techniques that we have developed at L3 Harris ASV to enable our safe autonomous navigation. So I'm going to start with an overview of our autonomy system just to put things into perspective and explain what we use machine vision for and why it's so important for our autonomous navigation. So we start with the perception of the system where we take in raw data from our various sensors, cameras, radar, LIDAR, AIS, various charts and external data feeds. And then that gets fed into the intelligence system. And the first thing the intelligence system has to do is make sense of this data to build up a big picture situational awareness of the uh, of the environment around us. 
so it will take in all this data from different uh, different sensors, which have got different types of information and different amounts of noise and things that need uh, sensoring through. Um, and it will make sense of that, turn it into a situational awareness picture. Uh, and then it needs to turn that into some kind of decision. So we need to take this information, evaluate our options and decide how we're going to react to that. And then having made the decision, we then need to carry it out. So we'll send instructions to the controls that say turn left to avoid this collision or whatever the action is. Um, now, as the AI of the system develops, we're finding that the human machine uh, relationship is changing. So we have this human machine uh, fe uh, feedback um, interface. But as I say, as the intelligence uh, increases in the machine, we're finding that the the relationship, the form of that relationship is evolving and it will constantly evolve as we develop. So the, where the machine vision comes in is a crucial component of the situational awareness of the system. So one of the things we do with machine vision is object detection and classification. So we will train algorithms that can look at data frames and scan through them and identify where there are objects of interest for us. So here's an example of that working in action. So what we've got here is our autonomous vessel transiting out through the Solent. And on the right hand side, you can see there are some sailing boats parked up and our autonomy algorithm is detecting that we've got those sailing boats there and alerting us to the fact that they're there and we want to avoid them to avoid a collision. Now we're constantly going out in different environmental conditions to test our algorithms in different scenarios. And in this particular case, we went out on a day where it was all a bit horrible and overcast to test that the algorithm could still work in these gray and kind of muggy conditions. Now, in principle, that might sound like a fairly simple task to do, but it's actually to get a computer to do it, it's actually really difficult. And the reason is because it's it's really difficult for us as humans to, to really define what the problem is that we're actually trying to solve. Um, so for example, when we're looking at objects visually, the same object might have a variety of different visual representations. So for example, if I'm looking at a chair, I could, I could describe a beanbag as a chair, but I could also describe an office chair as a chair or a dining room chair as a chair. So all of these things look very, very different visually and describing what that, that looks like, um, just, just, just describing how to identify that just from visual representation alone is a really difficult problem. Um, equally, there can be things that are belong to very different classes that actually look quite have a lot of uh, visual features in common. So, for example, a basketball and an orange, both round and orange objects. Um, but actually, they're how you would define them. The classes that they actually fit into are completely different. So sometimes you get a bit of kind of blurring and obf obfuscation between the class boundaries that can make it hard for the machine vision algorithm to work out how to differentiate, how to separate the uh, different classes. And also uh, images don't on their own don't have any depth perception. So there's all this contextual information that we have as humans that help us to make decisions about what we're looking at that a machine just doesn't have. So when we're trying to train an algorithm or when we're trying to develop an algorithm to identify what different objects are just purely looking at their visual features it's a difficult problem for us to describe how to solve that as humans and therefore it's a difficult thing to uh, get a computer to do so this is where machine learning comes into play because as i said it's a hard problem for us to define we can flip the problem on its head and get machine learning to learn directly from the data. So rather than us having to define a, a mathematical function, we can get the machine to work it out for itself. But to do this, you need to have enough data to comprehensively teach your algorithm the problem that you're trying to solve. So for example, in the, in the chair example, if you wanted to learn you know, what the different, different types of chairs can look like, then you have to have the variety of data to cover all the different uh, scenarios of what a chair can look like. Um, 
And also another problem we have is that because the function is learned by an algorithm, it's not something that we've worked out for ourselves. It's, it, and because it's a vastly complex algorithm and the kind of the, the kind of features that it will pick out from the um, from the image and and group them all together and the way it might group them all together could be really 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 complicated um, and it could even think of think, think think up things that we would never have thought of ourselves so that can make it really hard for us to to really know what it's actually learnt beneath the bonnet and to really understand that the resulting algorithm has got that discerning capability to really be able to tell you what a you know what a chair actually is and you know define and to be able to define things with 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 certainty so let's talk about the process for developing a machine learning model to illuminate this process a bit more so i mentioned how data is really important um, now, a lot of people are probably aware that typically for machine learning problems, you need lots of data, but, but really the key is having the variety of the data to really teach the algorithm what you want it to learn and make sure it doesn't overfit to a particular scenario if you don't give it enough data. Um, so we are always going out collecting data in the real world whenever we get the opportunity to. Um, to cover the variety of different environmental conditions and different parts of the world where things look different, the sea looks a different colour and all sorts of different things, different factors that might potentially um, be, be confusing for an algorithm. But also to give us an extra bit of control over what we're feeding into our algorithms, we, use, we make use of simulators. And once we've got all this data, to make it useful for the algorithms, of course, we have to tag them as well. Now with simulated data, we can automate this process because we're controlling what's being, what's being generated. With real world data, we have to go through and do the labeling ourselves. So we've developed uh, some data labeling tools that will help us do the job. Um, and we have a semi-automated labeling process where we'll have an automated process that runs through and does a first pass, and then we can go through and refine manually. Um, once you've got your data ready, to be fed into an algorithm and maybe you've done some sampling made sure you've got a good variety a good spread of examples to to give your algorithm the best chance possible of of learning what you need it to learn um, we then feed it into our algorithms and they'll do a bunch of training and because it's quite a complex uh problem that they're trying to solve and quite a com complex function that it's trying to learn this can this can take a, a long time to do the training and then as a result of that, you get your visual object detector out, which we can then run on our boats and feed into our collision avoidance algorithms. So data collection, I mentioned how this was a really important thing and capturing the variety is, is, is really important. So we've been collecting data since 2006. And as I said, we're going out in different conditions all the time. Whenever we get an opportunity, particularly if it's a new location that we haven't visited before, we're always going out and collecting, collecting as much data as we possibly can. And we'll use different cameras, we'll use different, um, different sensors, we'll try and get pictures of objects from different, different angles. And uh, as I said, we'll go out in different weather conditions um, and, and do all sorts of things to get as much variety as we possibly can in, in our data set. And, uh, and we're also interested in, in things, in anything that makes the visual scene look different. So if we can get capture pictures with sort of water on the lens um, or, or anything, you go, go out at nighttime as well and capture infrared images, anything that makes it look different, that's all interesting to us because it's the, it's the variety that we need. Okay, so once we've generated our data sets, we've done some training, we then want to understand how good are our models actually at identifying our different classes of interest. So here I've got three different models that I'm comparing, and there are, there are plenty of classical approaches for doing this. Um, in this particular example, I'm uh, using what are called rock curves. Um, I don't know how much people know about rock curves, but essentially, um, the, the more the orange curve is pulled up to the top left-hand corner of the graph, um, the better the classifier is at differentiating between the different classes. Um, and now this is really good at giving you a quick overview of, of roughly kind of how the, how the classifiers are performing. 
But what we're really interested in is how well has it actually learnt the problem? So how well is it actually understanding what the different classes are and how to, um, how to define the different classes visually? Um, so I mentioned how that was quite a difficult thing to do because the machine learning algorithm has developed some, has worked out some features um, that, it, that it thinks are useful for, for uh, solving the problem beneath the bonnet, but we don't necessarily know what they are. So what we need is a technique that can give us a bit of insight into that. So this is an approach that we've developed to achieve that. And what I've done here is I've taken the original images and I've represented them in terms of the features that are learnt under the bonnet of the different algorithms. And Typically, when it's, in, when it's represented in those kind of features, each image will be in a really, really, really high dimensional data space. So it's something that's difficult for us to visualize. Um, but we've got a technique here that enables us to project the data down into two dimensions so we can visualize it. Um, and then I've overlaid, the, overlaid it with the information about which class each image belongs to, to give us a feel for how well um, we're really separating out the different classes and how well we're really the algorithm is really starting to understand how to differentiate the different classes from each other. And by the way, this map actually wraps around top to bottom and left to right. So what you actually get is a donut, but for the purposes of making it easy to visualize here, I've, I've flattened it out. And what we're seeing is in models, in models one and two, there's quite a lot of uh, confusion. So basically the more, the more speckled and the more overlap there is between the different classes, the more confused the algorithm is, the algorithm is about how to differentiate different classes out. And the more well-defined the different clusters are, the, the better a job it's doing. Um, so certainly model one is, looks very confused. Model two is starting to do a bit of a better job. So these features, are, this is an indication that these features are probably better for solving our problem, but still it's not really brilliant. Um, however, if we look at model three, uh, what we can see is that it really is learning. It really is actually learning much better how to differentiate the, differentiate the different classes. And what we can do is we can look at the specific examples of things that it has uh, has um, classified really well, or things that it does appear to believe that are in the center of the cluster and other things that are sort of on the border that it's getting a bit confused about. Um, and then we can analyze those, those specific examples and understand and start to understand what kind of features are driving the algorithm's performance and driving its decision-making. Okay, so that's our object detection and classification capability. There are other things we use machine vision for to aid our navigation system. And one thing is target following. And this is the beginnings of an autonomous docking system that we are developing. So how it works is we stick, uh, with, in this example, we stuck a QR code to the back of the support vessel in front and our autonomous vessel behind is using the positioning of the um, uh, of the QR code in front to align itself to follow in the wake of the vessel in front. So this is an example of us using machine vision to uh, position ourselves very precisely in relation to another object. Hannah, you've got about five minutes if that helps. That's great. I'm on my final slide now, actually. Oh, so. wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so uh, we've got our 360 degree bird's eye view, which is used for really useful for uh, remote operators when they're navigating in, uh, in a tight scenario, if perhaps they're trying to dock or they're, they're navigating in a, a heavily cluttered environment. Um, and we, we've got our 360 degree camera array and we can project the images down um, to give that bird's eye view of what's happening immediately around the vessel and aid the operator and um, give them a very clear picture of uh, the obstacles immediately around them and help them to navigate. So that is a quick summary of the various types of machine vision work we have going on at AS ASV um, and how we use it for our autonomous missions. Brilliant, thank you very much, Hannah. I'm sure I've got I have a few questions, I'm sure, sure the other panel members will too. 
Uh, so I wanted to introduce our third talk, um, and Felix um, from Norway is going to um, talk about uh, Pale Blue, which is an industrial VR company. Um, Felix is the managing director and the leading technical expert. And he's worked lots of different places in technology and software, including ones that we all know, like Acre Solutions and Sun Microsystems, but also other small and medium sized um, enterprises. Uh, he's covered a range of roles, including software engineer, system architect, project manager, and now managing director. Um, Pale Blue leads the way on developing virtual reality, augmented reality, and 3D simulators you know, for real world solutions, helping clients to digitize uh, their data. Um, a better training, streamline workflow, and improve safety. Felix, looking forward to your talk. Take it away. Thank you, Alison. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, come through. So, the topic that I'm going to present today is called uh, Simulators and Artificial Intelligence Working Together. Uh, my name is Felix Gorbacevic, and I'm the um, one of the team members here at Pile Group. What Pile as a company is focused at is different kinds of simulator and training systems. Typically, those are used for humans, but it's not unthinkable that the same thing, the systems that are in some contexts are uh, also used for machines and artificial intelligence. Or all through the years, we've been focusing on different uh, segments, even though our main focus area is within the industry and the energy sector, where we uh, produce different kinds of training simulators, um, including the fancy technologies of virtual reality and augmented reality. So, um, the uh, different ty types of systems really uh, span from screen based to virtual reality based. Uh, to operational chairs uh, with joysticks. And those systems allow to reproduce specific operational conditions for not just human, but also human machine interaction and team training. There are some known pitfalls uh, within the area that uh, We've been uh, operational, and that is the incidents and accidents when there's a lack of awareness, insufficient training, not being exposed to the full work scope, uh, not being aware of the other team members. And all that can lead to production stops, operation stops, damaged equipment, and uh, missed deadline. That's some of the uh, potential outcomes here. So, Traditionally, there's a number of tools that um, we have been applying uh, for the industry in order to help addressing those uh, problems and avoiding those problems. Uh, virtual reality and augmented reality are just two of these tools. Um, and of course, there's a number of different control options that one can use when controlling a certain machine for operation, whether that's with hand recognition, virtual reality gloves, uh, controllers or the traditional operator chairs. I mean, there's a lot of flexibility in um, how one can control an operation, um, whether that's spanning from manual training, whether that's going to the full actual operational control of the machine. So all these different um, options exist, fully dependent on the project budget, fully dependent on the amount of flexibility and the interactivity that is needed in a certain operation. Um, it's also important that when we're training the humans or when we're training the machines uh, that we are trying to achieve one-to-one -one behavior in the, um, in the simulated medium, um, we want to reproduce the processes as they occur um, so that the resulting training systems can also be quality controlled and verified, such as, for example, giving an example of uh, International Marine Contractors Association approving some of our digital systems for training of personnel uh, due to the nature that the conditions, the pressures, the uh, gas mixes, the working conditions are reproduced um, very close to reality in a digital setting, in a digital simulator. Um, 
We want to immerse the humans, we want to immerse the machines. With that, we want to give users uh, freedom of movement in different synthetic environments, whether those are on land, whether those are underwater, subsea. We've done a number of systems for uh, commercial diving. I'm sure there's a clip coming in that as well. So in this, again, we need to balance uh, what kind of tool set we're able to use. And typically, um, we aim to look at the off-the-shelf available systems, such as this. Uh, this is a standard issue of um, VR headset, typically available in uh, um, in the Best Buy or similar electronic store, um, where we would have to construct additional elements of the picture not really available in the sensors. If you see that the only sensors available are the headset and the hand controllers, meaning that the system doesn't really see or detect anything that's happening below the waist. And though the, those are the parts that we have to reconstruct by prediction algorithm using inverse kinematics, trying to position the legs as they can be in this specific moment of time. And this adds to the immersiveness of humans, but also this adds to the immersiveness of machines because machines would then scan the surrounding area. If it's the ROVs and humans working together, we want to produce an artificial point cloud and also for the virtual humans. So this is one of the examples where we want the visuals to be more or less corresponding with the reality. So whether the visual sensors or the LiDAR sensors would be able to detect um, a realistically looking environment. Now, here's another example uh, that comes to uh, making synthetic environments for um, underwater operators. In this case, this is a system for um, training virtual reality divers, where this is commercial divers operating. Um, then again, they have to go through the um, diving bell setup and lockout. They have to open the hatch. They have to go onto the seabed. Uh, where they interact with others, where they interact with the ROV pilots. So this is, a, again, a simulated environment um, made to be rather realistic, made to simulate the environment and to, the ability of changing and uh, varying the amount of visibility, say, how on how many meters visibility one would be able to get in a certain scene. So this is where the human operators, again, can uh, be immersed in that medium, where they can rehearse in different scenarios. And you see the ROVs are uh, partaking in that as well. Uh, but this is one of the, uh, I think, uh, interesting examples where it's possible to run through an, uh, an um, operation. And we all know that the machines have the simulation capabilities. All the PLC, the programmable logic controllers, have a simulation mode that allows us to go and test them out in different scenarios and conditions and see how the autonomous logic will uh, work. But the truth is, most of the operations, they also involve humans in the same scene. So this is why our focus has been on combining machines and humans in the same virtual scenes for all those different operations and making sure that we can uh, really operate the equipment by machines and by the humans. Well, yes, uh, with the checklists and procedures, and this is where you would go through the normal operations uh, as well as the emergency operations. Um, operating uh, the machines, and in this case, the ROVs, uh, we are looking into the modern ways of how the interactivity can be done for manual control and for uh, autonomous controls. This is when we're mapping, again, a standard issue VR headset with the VR controllers, and we're mapping that to um, the ROV's manipulators, in this case, a seven function and a five function. So we're solving essentially an inverse kinematic uh, problem of positioning the manipulators the way that the human hands are positioned and following up with all the joints that are found in an ROV um, arm. So um, this is yet another way of how 
this technology can be plugged in for certain prototyping, uh, for certain, uh, not just training, but also operations. And in, our, in, in the studies that we've done, we see that this can be pretty understandable and straightforward, even though you have to learn the, um, the original manipulator is quite a bit before you can break them. The master controller arm of the selling function, the joystick for the five function. Uh, going into this method of operation, um, it's, it becomes much uh, shorter time for learning how to do certain stabbing and certain underwater uh, manipulator related operations. So, um, programmable logic controllers that are driving the autonomous machines on the subsea, on the top side. Uh, the way they are set up uh, is well known that they have the real motors that they are able to run back and forth, and they have the real sensors. This is the impression of the outside world. They can sense the environment and they can then um, affect the environment either by moving through it or really interacting with it. So in uh, our simulated um, or synthetic environment, we take away the real components and we plug the very same programmable logic controllers into the virtual uh, counterpart. And then again, many in this industry are doing a similar thing when we're taking away the real feed, uh, the real feed from the cameras, the real feed from the other sensors, and we're replacing that with the virtual feed from the virtual replica of this world, where machines then, well, are essentially fooled by thinking that they're sensing certain work conditions and they are able to uh, then run their virtual motors, not being aware that the whole machine experience is uh, not real, but synthetic. So combining this virtual sensor and virtual motor and a PLC, uh, we produce a digital twin for real equipment because there's a PLC running the brain, but we have to create a virtual, if I may, physical copy of the machine in having the geometry, having the thrusters, having the manipulator arms, and then we put that virtual copy, the digital twin, into the virtual environment. So this is where the PLC, the brain is disconnected from the um, from any reality, and it drives the digital copy in a digital world, interacting with the other digital actors. Now, for the autonomy, we know, well, based on the uh, NASA's uh, level of autonomy of an automation system, one can list uh, eight levels of autonomy. If we start uh, at level one, this is where the human alone can execute the decision. Uh, now on the level two, uh, the human is the prime source of execution. And then as we move upwards, the amount of autonomy uh, grows to when the system still allows the human to have a certain vital time before the execution, um, context-dependent, pre-programmed, um, or on the level six, the system allows for the override after execution has taken place. Uh, level seven and eight are higher with level eight when there's no any allowance for the human interaction and the system performs fully autonomously. And then again, in different segments, there's different um, there's different level of adoption of how autonomous the operation are. Um, if you take the um, autopilot on the um, autopilot on the jets and the airplanes, they obviously have uh, taken it rather far. And if you're thinking, say, today's drilling systems, they're still uh, quite low. Um, they're not really on the upper part of the spectrum. Um, so our task then in here is to enable the AI to use the simulators. Uh, we have to make a copy of the environment because uh, that's where the, uh, the machine is going to be immersed in. We have to copy the environment in the ways that can be read by a machine. We have to copy perhaps the visuals. Sometimes we have to copy the thermal signatures of the environment. And uh, if there's a laser scan, we have to make sure that our virtual 
world uh, allows for a virtual laser scan that can be then perceived by a machine. Um, here we come to an interesting way of operation. Then, then again, we've been uh, looking at a lot with the drilling operators, um, which comes to these four steps. When we have the real environment, but we have the virtual environment as well. And we've trained our machines, so they know how to operate. But still, when we're operating in an unknown environment, such as drilling, we never know how the drilling process will actually uh, go, just because there's a lot of unknowns, uh, and a lot of unknown variables in the lithology and how the drill string will go. Um, so we uh, have come with the set of steps that allows the machine to coexist in the real world and in the virtual world. So perhaps so this is best illustrated by this, but AI operates in two worlds at the same time. First, it has the digital twin of the uh, environment, of the machinery, of the situation. And then each specific frame, it can try a certain move in its prediction model. So let's say it can try the certain strategy for drilling uh, with the uh, higher RPM, or it can try to do a certain rotation in the drilling. And then based on the digital uh, model, it can see, all right, I've tried these different ways and according to the digital environment, the best strategy is this. And that's the one it is applying to the reality at the same time. So it's two processes happening in parallel when the digital and real coexist, when the two processes coexist, but the machine has the opportunity, like in chess, to play out different moves going forward, pick the best one for this specific moment in time, apply it, and continue with the real process. And again, the real feedback from the real drilling or the real um, operation will feed back to the digital twin, updating the digital twin. If you have a different experience in the lithology, if you have a certain shift, uh, that feeds back to the digital twin, allowing you to keep your model up to date, still make predictions, still try different strategy, but align the virtuality as the reality is. Um, lessons learned. Uh, distributed collaboration uh, really helps uh, now in the COVID times. Uh, I think it's becoming rather um, understood by many where we can connect people and machines from different sites. Uh, people don't have to be in the same room anymore. We do a lot of distributed training. We do a lot of uh, operational checkups that are distributed and not bound to the same room anymore, just because we have these uh, digital twins that allow us to do these digital operations. Um, just uh, give an example again, maybe outside of the um, industrial area uh, as we've been lucky enough to get started to work with the space industry. So for this year, we've done already a number of um, modules on the International Space Station and our training has been more or less a copy of what you see here on the screen. Our astronauts being trained and some of the autonomous uh, logic uh, meets online connecting from different countries. So, um, if this is a project prepping, if this is a certain study for the equipment, it's completely possible to take that online. Um, there's a number of benefits using simulators. Um, again, I would say that training simulators for humans, that's a known thing. Training simulators for the machines, maybe not so known as of today. And then again, operational simulators that allow the machine to uh, perform better and make better decisions with having digital and physical model at the same time uh, is something that we're just getting into. Um, it doesn't look like this will take away the need of real hands-on training, real hands-on uh, operation on site, but this can be complementary to what has been done already and simulators can make certain things easier and more effective. So combining those things, uh, just a small demonstration really of how one offshore operation of taking a module from the oil rig and then onto the seabed can be done in a constellation of a number of humans and machines 
working together and then we're getting 10, 15 or maybe 20 participants at the same time uh, working in this visual replica in this virtual world uh, so that they can all cooperate and uh, conduct a certain operation in all the different roles that they're having. So it's not single role training, it's all the different roles uh, seeing each other and being able to interact to solve a certain task. With that, we'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Uh, oh, pretty much bang on time as well. So um, now we go into the to like kind of a round table. Um, I, I wonder if we start start with you, Felix, as you, you finish. So many of the the ideas you're sharing seem completely relevant given the the really difficult time we've all been through and trying to get work done. Um, I, I wonder if if you could say something about the kind of uptake you've had with you know trying to get people ready to go offshore when you know it's difficult to bring people together. I mean it, it seems like your distributed collaboration model um, really fits with with the kind of constraints we've got at the moment. Oh I think you might be on mute Felix sorry. <laughs> I see you done. <laughs> now you're back. Right. So um what we've been seeing, well, then again, this year, it's more visible than we, mm. what we've seen in 2019. People really um, now tend to start realizing the value of being able to train mm. meet in 3D. Um, and uh, we've mm. done, I think, a number of trainings and sessions this year when for the digital copy oil rigs, we've done joint sessions uh, where I think you can come with a number of good arguments there. If there's a mm. shut shutdown that is often so, you would be able to execute it more effectively if you run mm. it. If there's new people ramping up, then you're able to ramp them up also in mm. the virtual model. And I'm get, I guess as well as you, you can you can get started while people are still in their home location, right? Before they you know before they have to travel. Um, that surely must be so helpful for operators and contractors who are trying to get work done. Absolutely. I mean, there's quite a bit saving on travel just because the mm. hardware is off the shelf. So as long as you can get a VR headset in the uh, yeah. nearest uh, Best Buy or a similar store, you should mm. go. And then again, not all of the experience has to be in VR. Some could be just in 3D using your screen. So then you wouldn't even have to get a VR headset. And, and I can see in, in um, some of the work I've been involved in, people are starting to uh, use these augmented reality to, to kind of do what if, you know, discussions and get people to have better situation awareness. Are you, are you saying the same stuff? So I, I, I'm thinking beyond just training, but actually supporting operations. I imagine you're seeing the same thing come through now. Um, probably the biggest trend that we're seeing now is the remote support when there's the back end office with the engineers mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you're able not to travel each time mm -hmm. when there's certain mm -hmm. assistance needed offshore. But instead with HoloLens or a similar setup, you're able to bring the engineer remotely and make able the, uh, enable the technician in the field to operate machinery that perhaps he is not fully aware of the full specification of and remote support to augmented reality allows that. Okay, and then I, I, got, I just one kind of other follow up question. I open up to the others. I, I know because all all companies must be engaged in this, trying to sustain the quality of the digital twin. You know, fidelity of data is always challenging. Um, how have you helped your clients? You know, overcome some of those types of challenges because I, I know that must be real a real challenge for everyone, right? That's a pain point for many. Um, then, with the, with installations out there, not everyone has an updated CAD model, unfortunately. Sometimes you have to remodel it based on the uh, uh, laser scans, or sometimes we just go for the, by the photos. Sometimes they just send a bunch of photos on the installation, and we have to blend that with the previously dated CAD model. So, uh, I mean, it's a struggle for many, and not everything is perfectly logged back into the CAD when there's a certain modification being done in the field. But there's a number of ways how to address that. Uh, when there's no CAD, it's possible to use other data, including photo, including photogrammetry, uh, when you're just using the video feeds from the RVs or so to reconstruct the field as, as it is today. Okay. Um, Adrian or Hannah, did you have any kind of comments or questions? I, I imagine, Adrian, you must, because you're 
you must be helping other clients do somewhat similar things with, with some of your hardware and software offerings. I, I can see you're on mute still, so I thought I'd give you that tip first. <laughs> yeah, very good. I never learned. It's, uh, I think it, it's interesting. I'm, I won't even claim to be, I, I know very little about digital twins. Um, I suppose what, what kind of resonates with me from a Catholic perspective is uh, what, what I think we can, we're providing into that environment, uh, and, I, and I suppose the only thing I'm not sure on is the is the time scale for the type of work that Catholic does. If you look at uh, the different applications, but where I think it gets fascinating is uh, training is one thing, but education and one of the long term objectives for what Catholic is is doing is apart from let's say the oil and gas, uh, we have if you look at the work we've done with the Alfred Wegener Institute or the work that they've done with our systems, let's say. Uh, they're able to track um, Arctic ice melts by looking at cropped rocks on the seafloor. Uh, and, and, and it's one thing to, is to, what we're actually creating is real data for that virtual environment. Uh, and I think from an education and awareness point of view, it, it's fascinating because if we can kind of make the data uh, accessible on that scale uh, and create that environment for interacting with it, particularly like I'm an, I'm an old guy, but, but for, for somebody who at five years old can use a smartphone and, and, and you know, it's going to be using VR headsets in a few years time. I think it's fascinating. And I think it's, um, we're, we're certainly looking at it beyond, you know, even the next five to 10 years, but how do you interact with data? And, and we're trying to comply with, you know, workflows from 10 years ago, 20 years ago today in one hand, but at the same time, look at that going forward. So uh, I'm, I'm more informed than I was two hours ago for sure, but I think I have a bit more homework to do. So Adrian, what, oh, sorry, Felix, I was going to say, get, sorry to interrupt, and maybe both you could address this point, because I think there's something about the digitization and the digitalization where you like reimagine the workflow. And all three of the talks I saw saw that coming through where we're starting by just digitizing and then now we reimagine how to do the work. Right. So, sorry, Felix, you, you carry on, but I, I thought that was worth mentioning because it comes out in all three talks. I was just to add that, yeah, education is something that is really picking up as well with uh, with these technologies. It also goes to can when there's a, uh, say when you have to study the environment and educate the others on how the environment is um, evolving. That's one point that you can also educate on the equipment. And when you're educating on the equipment, also you'll have to look into can this be certifiable. Is your VR or 3D experience just a nice visual part of it, or can it be approved? Can it get a license after using it? And then it then goes back to the certifying organizations such as DMVGL, such as IMCA. And I, uh, we can see that they can kind of get very hands on with this, and they are now working on the uh, not just the simulator regulations, but also VR. Can you have a class A fully immersive uh, simulator training in a VR for either a plane or ROV? And the answer to that is yes, hopefully very soon. Okay, that's that's good to hear. Um, Adrian, I'd sort of follow, following on, um, I, I was really interested to see um, how you started to address kind of some of this AI at the edge type you know, kind of problems because I, I know you know you might you must know this too is when when we're moving to these better sensors we're creating much more data and less vessel time means processing comes on shore and, and obviously you know it is expensive to process giant data sets it, it, it this is a new workflow right this is digitalization but it seems very promising right yeah, I think so. So how we're, kind of, we're we're tackling it at the moment actually because we have. If you look at if you take a very simple case for an ROV flying around a subsea structure, mm. collecting anywhere between ten and twenty five thousand images, uh, as well as you know lower density data at three D point cloud data, uh, we, you don't need all of that to do what needs to get done. Uh, I, I'm becoming more much more familiar with the, the cost of cloud based storage, for example. So, so, so in terms of um, the volume of data, there's no need to put it all in. So I think how we're tackling it is, is you know, and, and keep in mind there's many applications. And in some cases, our clients just don't want us to see the data. We're never going to see it. So mm -hmm. the most important thing is getting information from data. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of what the presentation was about. It was about, well, on the vehicle, you need to know where you are, what you're looking at, and, and you need to know uh, well, these are the, my, the, 
I think the term is the data product. I need to know where my mines are or where my free spans are uh, and what they actually, what, what is the data? Are they 20 meters long and three meters deep or are they two centimeters deep and so on? So, so all the data in the world is meaningless if you have to trawl through it and get, you, you know, and that takes time and that's a little bit of the historical. So I think what we're trying to do is, uh, and, and the, the product actually in development is called CA Catholics Insights, where we're extracting information from the data at the time of acquisition with a view to dramatically reducing the amount of data that you have to store. And, 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 and let's call it, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're generating using manual interactions and almost a little bit like what Felix is talking about, using that training of the data sets to teach the machine vision and machine learning systems uh, what to look for. And then for, for our clients, if they have all of that data, you can very easily see a route to automation, but it has to keep in, in mind the business because you know, if, you, if you reduce the cost of the operation by 70% and you reduce the number of people by 70%, you know, it doesn't mean the work is free, right? So it's, it's, it's uh, uh, but somebody somewhere is going to try and make money and it's either going to be in the storage. So you have to look at the whole system. And for Catholics, uh, you know, in a, in a rapidly changing world, we're trying to do the right thing for our business short term and long term. And I think that's a bit of a balancing act. But for sure, uh, I think if you, if you focus on just collecting the data uh, as efficiently as possible, extracting the most valuable information from it, um, and, and, and doing it with the least cost possible at all times, then at least you've done ninety percent, and the rest is really down to nature taking its course. I think. Okay, and, and you, you're obviously responding to COVID in the way of continuing to automate and make things easier to deploy in the field. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought it was quite quite interesting how you come up with an integrated, yeah, like yeah. touch solution, right? Yeah, the, less, the lessons learned, I think, we, we probably, we had planned to deploy what the, the observer system in 2022. Okay. But, but on March 17th this year, we actually changed that to 2021. Uh, and it was helped by the fact that we didn't have our guys going offshore. So, so we actually had a lot of product focus locally in, you know, and, and, and if anything, uh, that focus kind of said, okay, what are, the, what, what are the things we can change to do it faster and deliver the service in 2021? And it came down to, well, let's put it all into one housing, no cables, no wires, um, yeah. no collaboration, it was all done and dusted, ship it out. And actually, from a business point of view, let's leave it there. And, and, and we don't even have the logistics. We can get it into, whether it's Angola or Brazil, it, it can stay there and that's all done and we'll support it remotely. So now, that all remains to be, to happen, but mm. given the learnings from previously, uh, I think we have a really good chance of success. And for us, it's about, making this available and accessible to all of these. So uh, it's been interesting in the sense that in the last six months, uh, I think you said it before we started recording, Al, everything has changed. We have to, we have to respond, uh, but in that is the opportunity. And I think that's kind of where, where Catholics has got. So I also, also wanted to ask about uh, how maybe some of the other industries or sectors you work with, like, like the research science have, have uh, driven um, you know, the, the products you're offering. And, and I'm going to come on to Hannah in a minute because there's lots that, you know, the research science community have done and defence for us with um, as an energy industry with the autonomous machines. But I was wondering if that had, had also kind of come out in, in your work in terms of, you know, what the fisheries are asking for, you know, what the, yeah, you know, I those think... other kinds of science research guys are asking for, if it's driving us in a particular direction, it's helpful. Uh, yeah, I, th I think it, it's, be, it's been over the years, um, you know, at a board level in Catholics, even we were always conscious of being heavily oil and gas dependent. So, so very early on, we would have shipped systems for sustainable fisheries to the marine mm -hmm. in Ireland. Um, mm -hmm. They used to pull a sled across and record video, whereas what they do now is they, um, they use our system. They can actually use machine vision on the shrimp nests. Uh, and the whole idea, it's sustainable fishery. So the objective is to count the population of shrimp. Uh, mm. And if, it, if it's too low, then stop fishing. Uh, mm. Let it grow back up again. Mm. I think, you know, that's one aspect. The other is deep sea mining. Like, mm. the, you know, if we want electric cars and nickel and coal, mm. mining is it's a traditionally dirty industry. But if mm. we want clean cars, we need to go and get this stuff. But we need to do it sustainably. So, so mm. the best way for, from a Catholic's perspective as well, Let's record and go back to the large volumes of data that has accessible information. Know what was there before. We we have to accept that there is going to be some level of 
mining, for example, but let's do it in a way that we can prove it and gather the evidence to show it is sustainable. So, so for CAFEX, we see probably the next 10 years, the world wants to see this data and this evidence. And mm -hmm. those industries, whether it's mining or whether it's defense, or, well, maybe not defense so much so, but certainly mm -hmm. all the other areas, people want to know what, has, what was it like before, what's it like mm -hmm. now, you know, things like mm -hmm. CO2 storage, and mm -hmm. we're going to store CO2, can we get a baseline before it? Mm -hmm. We track, is it a positive impact? Is, you know, is photosynthesis happening? Is, you know, are we cleaning mm -hmm. up, are we making it better? And then, so there's a whole raft of applications that we see. I think the Alfred Wegener stuff, the environmental monitoring, I think, I think anecdotally, and certainly I don't have all the evidence, but there's a lot more focus on local shallow water environmental surveys with photographic data, certainly around the coast of Ireland, I guess, UK and, and US and Australia have heard about too. But building that database of evidence in a way that you know, we can actually track our own impact um, at every level and, 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 and stop the speculation and stop the bias. Uh, even you know the researchers do good research, the, the, the industrialists you know, want to make things happen, but there needs to be a balance and the balance has to be evidence. Uh, and for Catholics, we're seeing a benefit from that, certainly, uh, in, 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 let's call it the, the subsea sector, where, where, where high resolution data and measurement is, is, is the ultimate piece of evidence. So I have one other question for you, for you which is, um, is about uh, having some kind of common standards and, and you know, that when new technologies come in, um, you know, proprietary standards sometimes start and then eventually try and get towards open standards and then you can go so far with the contractor and you decide you want to change, there's a way of changing and then it's sort of, it usually industries take off at that point because, you know, people have the confidence to, to go yeah. forward. Are we, are we, do you feel like we're sort of getting there now with some of the new technologies around auto eventing and, and things like that, where we've got a way to go yet still? And um, of course, I'm going to be very biased in the answer to that. To say, I think of course, that's why I'm asking you, <laughs> because I thought you might have a very interesting perspective about the, the balance between yeah. build a sustainable business and yeah. trying to grow the, the industry, right? There's, there's always a balance. But. Uh, yeah, I think, I think there's, um, I think the, we're just trying to help with the answer. I think there is, uh, the auto, for, for me, and, and I have a background 20 years in machine vision, uh, mm -hmm. if you go back to 2000, 1999, I think I filed a patent around machine vision for semiconductors, right, you can go public. Uh, and at that time, you know, it, it was a, a piece of circuit board coming in from a, a mobile phone manufacturer on a, on a machine. And even then, you know, and, and today, it's not reliable, right? You, you know, machine vision with images is one thing. Mm -hmm. But what we've developed in Catholics is, is, is and, and I think even for Hannah, uh, you know, if you look at some of the problems with machine vision, it's the reliability of that information. You know, the machine doesn't know how far away, how near. It's, it's, so, so, so when we set out on Catholics, we said, look, we want to do it fast because if we don't reduce the boat time, nobody's going to care. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, great. If, if we now, if we don't, now we, ha and we have to fit with the workflow. So, so you know, we've kind of transitioned to a point where at least now we can start talking about standardization because there's a lot of data. Uh, but we have to fit with the way things are going. And that's always a, you know, if somebody had said to us three years ago, forget about trying to fit with the workflow, here's the money to go and make it automated, we'd actually be done. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that's constantly the battle. And I think uh, for, for new technology and as a business, and maybe that bridge is, for the business, it's easy to say, well, here's video and images underwater. You, you know, Hannah talked about, images above the water you know, mm. where, and the difficulty, but just if you take that underwater, say, is that going to work under? It just, our view is it's not. That's why we, you know, we have things like we can trigger in ultraviolet lights. We can look at the directions. Mm. These are in air, we, we did it years ago, but it's becoming of interest again because it does that thing. It d differentiates in the classification process. So that's what Catholics does. But I think the bigger question on standardization, it comes down to confidence and it comes down to evidence and that takes time and, and making sure you can still do what you need to do today so okay all right well thanks adrian i'm going to move move it on so we get to hear from everyone properly so hannah thank you for your talk as well and i, I thought when i was reflecting on it about how interesting it is that all three of these talks and the different technologies they're looking at come together to you know come come back with a kind of new a new business model um i was wondering about um, kind of the, the navigation things, I saw um, ants on deck recently as uh, when at one of the uh, one of the talks I went to, and I was really fascinated how people would be learning, you know, from animals about how to drive, how to navigate boats. Um, but I wonder if you wanted to say a, a little bit more about 
and some of the use cases that maybe ASV have been applying your your insights and that with the machine learning. You are still on mute, so I just I tell you that as well. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, so we, yeah, so our, so I suppose I'll talk generally about our, our autonomy system and, mm -hmm. and the various applications um, beyond uh, just machine vision. Um, so, uh, so we have a, our navigation system basically works on uh, well, what we define as a, a risk landscape. So we, our collision avoidance system internally kind of develops uh, a risk landscape, which is uh, an internal view of what the risk is in the surrounding environment uh, around us and gives the autonomy system indications about areas that it should avoid um, and areas that are safer for it to move towards. Um, and it also uh, incorporates in that some Colreg information. So certain things like overtake on the right and, and things like that. And you know, if you're navigating in a channel, these are the rules for giving way, and and you have to give way, or you have right of way, and all that, all that sort of thing. Um, so we incorporate all of these, all of these kind of rules, as well as information about what's going on around us, into our system to develop a kind of um, a path that's the the least path of resistance, if you like, the kind of the the optimum uh, the optimum solution to navigate around in the safest way. Um, but the other thing we have to think about is making sure that the vessel behaves um, in a way that's predictable for a human to uh, recognise, because um, typically um, one of one of the problems that we we can find is that if you just leave an autonomous navigation. Uh, process to itself um, and you just you just get it to respond to to what it's seeing in real time then uh, if you're not careful it can end up being very jittery and kind of changing direction very frequently um, and not really behaving at all how a human would but importantly not signaling clear intent to other people on the water about where you're going so then it makes it harder for other people to know how to respond to you um, so getting the vessel to behave more like a human and getting it to understand, you know, what is it, what is kind of acceptable human behavior and, and how to uh, give clear communications to others on the water. That's something that's really important for us to think about in our navigation. Um, so we're offering, we're using things like prediction algorithms to kind of look at, so we look at the state of the environment around us immediately, but also what's it going to be like in, you know, five seconds time, what's it going to be like in two minutes time, what's it going to be like in 10 minutes time, and use all of that information to help us uh, navigate an optimal path. Okay, and what about when you get to a swarm, because I know we're going to have use cases where lots of autonomous machines will, you know, be that, that, that in some ways might be easier, I don't know because mm. you're because you've got lots of data coming in from all of the actors around around yeah well actually if you've got lots of autonomous vehicles all working together then in 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 theory in some ways that's actually easier because they're all speaking the same language mm. um so one of the things that we're do doing is um we we've got some research going on at the moment into developing a kind of communication protocol for autonomous vehicles to to communicate with each other um and um, so, we're, so we're sort of developing this fr this framework where they can um, they can they can speak in the same language effectively, and they can say, okay, right, I um, I want to do this, but I'm restricted by the fact that I'm running out of fuel or something. Or you know, they can give each other useful useful uh, communications about what they what they what they want to do and how they can how they can uh, so they can understand each other's um, what each other's limitations are, but also what each other's um, intentions are. Um, and then they can also, and they can also react to that. So if 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 there's somebody that needs help or something, they can they can all rally around and help each other. So, yeah. So we're we're developing a framework to, and we're doing some research in that area right now. Cool. And um, how close do you think we are, um, or are we closing in on where where uh, the navigation is becoming reliable, predictable enough that it's sort of approaching where human is? I know there's all the sort of unusual instances where humans are much better but for the the more predictable normal kind of operations is, is the system getting close to replicating what a human is able to do for the routine i should say operations <laughs> um i think it depends a lot on the scenario um and i think it depends a lot on the so it depends for example whether you're in a very cluttered environment for example if you're in a mm -hmm. harbor or if you're out in open water um, and also, I think one of the really big challenges 
with um, navigating on the water is that it, so in theory there are all these coal regs but actually humans don't necessarily always abide by them so then that makes it harder for autonomous vehicles to identify what's going on but also to to work out how to behave themselves um, and you know and and you also have to kind of think about what does human behavior really mean here so um, does it mean you know responding to abiding by the coal regs you know all the time or does it mean um, does it just mean being being predictable does it just mean you know, not crashing into stuff, you know, what, what does it yeah. actually mean to be, what does it actually mean to be, to perform like a human? Um, I think that's a really that's interesting, really interesting question, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, obviously computers have got very different, um, very different uh, advantages compared to humans. So we're very good at putting things into context and you know, mm. making decisions and justifying our decisions. Mm. Computers are very, very good at processing information really quickly um and just and, and and displaying displaying information and um you know processing data really really quickly and and getting information so i think really the, the where we're going is um and the optimum probably yeah. is going to be having the two working yeah. together mm -hmm. but but working together in an optimal way so um we can have a situation where the the, the systems giving giving alerts you know but things that the human might not notice or picking things up ahead of time that the human might not be able to that, that a human might not necessarily recognize as quickly and as i said before bringing together or doing the sensor fusion to bring together all the data from disparate sources and things mm -hmm. building up one big picture so the human just can just focus on on that one picture um but the human is probably always going to be better at the the actual decision making and the justification and and you know ethically in many cases it is desirable for the human to really be making the decision rather than uh, rather than the machine um yeah so but, what, what you describe them um, is is as a is kind of somewhat in this book by eccentric called human plus machine and then one of the things they talk about is having like we have a human resources department like a machine resources department so as we become more reliant on on algorithms we you know we need to do do a, a better job or a more serious job about managing them. So I don't know if you have have seen any of that come through now, where there starts to be corporate mm. systems to look after our women. Well, yeah, I mean, and this is the thing. This is the really interesting thing about where the industry is going. I think there's going to have to be a big change in what users' expectations are of yeah. the systems and their their expectations of themselves to their responsibilities towards the system themselves. Because, I mean, like I was saying. At the start we you know you have to provide lots of variety of order scenarios for your machine to really learn um, mm. and 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 the only way to do that really is to be constantly teaching it so when you're out and about you yeah. have to be providing feedback to the machine constantly and telling mm. it yes you got this right no you got that wrong and that that's how that's the only way it's going to get better so to really use this stuff in anger and to get it to a point of being mm. really reliable mm. uh, that, that's what that's what we're going to have to do so so P, i think people's expectations are going to have to change and their expectations of themselves of their responsibility towards the system i think is going to have to change all right that's that's good i think we're we're nearly out of time so are there any final comments that um that you, you would like to make any of you so Anna, any any final thoughts you wanted to share with the audience um yeah i think um <laughs> Yeah. Well, I suppose the, the other thing I would say is that um, so, so I, I mentioned how um, the um, users have a, I think users have a lot of expectations um, of the system. I think because of the because of the way technology has evolved, um, you know, and, and you know, has evolved so rapidly recently, particularly with like machine vision applications. You know, people have facial recognition on their phones and things. Mm. People people kind of have the the same expectations of of image recognition in autonomy. Um, but the problem is the you know image recognition in an autonomous autonomous situation uh, autonomous vehicle scenario is much more complicated mm. than facial recognition <laughs> you know, on a phone um, and so I think we're kind of at the um, we're sort of in a uh, the, the top at the peak of a, a Gartner's hype cycle at the moment where there's a lot of a lot of excitement about what could be but there's still a lot of a lot more research that needs to be done to uh, to get us to a point where we you know where we're really safe and things could be reliable and I think there's going to have to be some patience and a lot of trialing um, a, lo a lot of working things out um 
so so yeah i think we're in a very exciting at a very in very exciting times but we we've also got a lot of work ahead of us sounds sounds good um, any final comment from you felix thank you Hal. Well, commenting on the perspective uh, in the simulators and in the remote collaboration and training uh, scenarios, it's also I think it's it's at the moment when now everyone is aware that those technologies are out there. Not everyone is aware how useful they might be to the training and operational scenarios. So um, there are early adopters, but we also see that the uh, the current circumstance and a certain uh, restriction on travel will accelerate the development of remote involvement, remote mm. training, remote operations. So that's something that we, we can also welcome. Yeah, and I, 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 that, 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 that seems, seems likely to happen. Adrian, do you have a final comment? Thank you, Felix. Oh, you're still on mute, Adrian, sorry. Do it again. I think uh, I'll just leave it with the, the, the parting comment is maybe make haste slowly. So it's, uh, <laughs> that's, I think it's the reality. Um, we, we, we have a good idea where we want to get to. We want to get there quickly. But the practicals say that, well, we're going to need to give it more time. And, and, and maybe the expression is the human learning has to be right before the machine learning is right. Okay, that's a good thought. All right. Well, listen, thank you, everyone. I uh, really appreciate your time today and look forward to working again soon. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye.